that Dr. Mohan and I were training, like with Benedict solution, if we did testing and decided on urine sugar, uh, what uh, medicine to give the patient, what would have happened today. But even in this day and age, we do get a call from the lab or from the patient, some kind of panic sometimes uh, that, you know, everything is okay, doctor, but urine sugar is showing four plus. So because they're taking an SGL2 inhibitor. So I think that's something we need to keep in mind. But it is the other thing that the benefit on long term heart and renal issues that has given them the pride of place right now, at least among the oral anti-diabetics. And actually, they have moved very rapidly in, in less than half a decade. They have moved up the pecking order to actually occupy a place alongside metformin, not even after. They have been actually parallel. And some people are saying in selected patients even before metformin. So I think, you know, I don't think any other drug has had this kind of journey. It is any other drug class has had this kind of journey. We also know that there is some reduction in body weight and that there's transient naturesis. Uh, and there is, of course, there is a modest decrease in blood pressure uh, also because essentially these drugs also work as mild diuretics. This will not be covered later. So I'm just saying, remember that if your patient is on a diuretic and is an elderly patient, especially, keep an eye on the fluid electrolyte or maybe adjust the dose of diuretic or on the postural hypotension that can sometimes happen if it is combined with a diuretic. It can be used with a diuretic, but uh, you have to be cautious and especially in elderly patients. Now, uh, the efficacy is, is, not, is not questioned anymore. I think that all is history. We know very well that these drugs are reasonably potent a uh, little more than DP4, you know, maybe in the same zone as metformin. They are, they are potent inhibitors of uh, SGLT2, but also, sorry, more importantly, potent uh, agents to lower blood glucose. So they are potent anti-diabetic agents. We know that. And then I already explained the truth is that they have many other benefits. There is some degree of weight loss. They don't cause any hypoglycemia. They lower the BP slightly. So all these are positive effects of this class of drugs. Now, let's look at a few trials, and this is just to set the stage, and you've probably heard these trials before, but I'll just give you some perspectives. The, the famous declared TIMI trial, and you can see all the trials in the last two years, as far as DAPA is concerned, the major trials. So this is uh, the, the famous declared TIMI trial, which was the cardiovascular outcome trial for DAPA glucose. And the trial design was that it was huge first there were 17,000, more than 17,000 patients with type 2 diabetes, about 7,000 established CV disease, and about 10,000 with risk factor. Double blind, randomized, all other diabetes treatments were same. One group was given DAPA, other group was, uh, group was given placebo. Follow up visits, and the primary endpoints for safety was MACE. Uh, that is major adverse cardiovascular outcomes, which is, as we know very well, the three point mace is CBD, cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, or, uh, uh, stroke. And of course, the dual efficacy was tested and they combined in between the trial, and we're not going into all that, CBD and HHF in one, and mace in another. So they were looking at CBD, HHF in, in one sort of composite. Uh, uh, outcome measure and HHF here means hospitalization for heart failure. So one is the classic atherosclerotic kind of uh, uh, endpoint, MACE, death, MI stroke. The other is combining because it was realized that many CV deaths may actually have happened because of heart failure. So then the CVD HHF combination was introduced in this uh, trial somewhere mid Well, we don't have to all the details. Uh, uh, 37% women, uh, Western population, mean BMI 32, duration of diabetes 11, 8.3 A1C, EGFR of 85. So by and large, the EGFR is pretty good, pretty good in this. Uh, different regions, but bulk is North America and Europe. 41% had established CV disease. So this is important. In, in some of the other trials, many much higher number in canvas and in uh, history of heart failure, and there were numerous glucose-lowering therapies. 
And what always amazes me that this is a high risk cardiac group and we never have statins go above 80% in any trial, which means even in the West, wherever we are, those patients who should clearly be on a statin, even there, it's only around 80% that actually end up doing that. So 80% on ACRB and 80% on statin, 75% on statin. So, and statin or azetimibe. So some of them have just been on azetimibe, not even statin. So anyway. This is something that always amazes me, so I, I, I point it out. Ideally, such a population should be at least 90% of statins. What did this study show? You've seen it's a large study across a patient population. Uh, if you look at CBD heart hospitalization for heart failure endpoint, you've found a clear cut superiority, right? Hazard ratio 0.83. If you look at the MACE, the classic three point MACE, you found a non inferiority, but no real difference between the blue and the uh, red line. So it wasn't superior in this large patient population. It wasn't superior, but it was certainly not inferior. So it was cardiac safe in terms of coronary heart disease, and it seemed to That's reduce cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure. If you look at secondary endpoints here, look at the renal composite endpoint, 40% reduction in the renal composite endpoint, which was GFR reduction, ESRD, or renal OCB death. All-cause mortality, again, was not significantly impacted. So all-cause mortality was not impacted. Uh, MACE was not so significantly impacted. But heart failure hospitalization, CV death hospitalization for heart failure, combined endpoint on renal composite endpoint was strikingly impacted. So it did not uh, uh, result in these two things, a lower rate of CVD or death from any cause. So let's say we compare with Empire. I mean, why did this happen? Uh, so firstly, uh, because uh, DAPA was a healthy renal population, so patients with a creatinine clearance of less than 60 ml were not included. And therefore, it is, you, we know that with declining GFR, there is a very significant increase in cardiac risk. And maybe because these drugs uh, are actually acting there, it is possible that you know when you're excluding people with lower creatinine clearance, you may have limited the mortality benefit. Overall, the population was much healthier. The mortality rates in the placebo were lower uh, than in the empire. So one good way of judging how sick your population is, is seeing the mortality rates or event rates in the placebo group. And this was clearly lower than what was seen in empire. So quite clearly, this was a population that was healthier. And uh, it could be uh, just a chance thing and confidence interval issue, which I'm sure others have discussed with you in the past. But the fact is that this was a less sick population than empire or even canvas both in terms of the, the cardiac status, also in terms of the renal status. And yet, the renal impact seemed to be, as a secondary outcome, quite striking. Just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about, I've taken this slide from the CANVAS study. If you look at the, the uh, this is the uh, renal outcomes that vary based on the baseline EGFR. And quite clearly, as the baseline EGFR is actually lower, the renal outcomes actually, the impact becomes a little less. You see this diamond here? But the, the slide that I couldn't find just now is that when the renal impact is, when the renal uh, baseline renal function is impaired, as the is lower, with lower GFR, you have a greater impact on coronary events with all these drugs. So you understand what I'm saying. If you stratify people according to GFR, you will find that the impact of SGLT2 in people with lowest e GFR goes in a different way. It has a greater impact on coronary events in people with low GFR and lesser impact on renal function in those with very low GFR. So this is important to understand, and this is a difference in the concept. Uh, conceptual, and that is really because these drugs are primarily acting through the kidney. We'll explain that again. If you look at the summary of, uh, summary of declared to me, you will find that quite clearly there is a, uh, this is the diabetes population, which is the primary prevention population. This is those who have disease, but no prior MI. This is prior MI, and this is recent prior MI. It's so very high risk. And if you stratify this population, the reduction in major adverse cardiovascular outcomes is mainly in this group. And this was such a large population where there wasn't that much reduction, and therefore the overall reduction in MACE was not significant. 
and the difference may well have been just a population difference as compared to uh, to canvas and empire egg. but the impact on hospitalization for heart failure and renal composite outcome was significant throughout the group so even those they use it for primary prevention very clearly you reduce the impact on cardio you had an impact on cardiovascular death and heart failure and you also had an impact on renal outcome so this is what it's trying to show but to get an impact on major adverse cv events and three point mays you probably need only the sick population to show that coming to the next one the depa heart failure uh, we won't spend too much time on this this because we know it works for heart failure and no confusion all sgl2 inhibitors work for heart failure again like the earlier one an event driven trial a primary endpoint was a composite of cv death so you saw that right cv death here also cv death and hospitalization for heart failure and here we are talking about cv death hospitalization for heart failure or an urgent heart failure visit requiring an intravenous administration of drug so they added this because this was otherwise being missed because sometimes patients with heart failure don't get hospitalized they go for an urgent visit and they come back after a few hours so it's not really so if you look at this again uh this is like the important part in this and the next study is that the people with diabetes and without diabetes so 2100 with diabetes 2600 without diabetes and they all had history of heart failure you can see that uh, nyha class 2 to 4 rejection fraction less than 40 nt pro bnp more than 600 and those were less than 30 now we reached 30 were excluded so you really are looking at at people who are who are uh, you know who have renal impairment very often and quite clearly who have significant uh, pump problem with their heart so again uh, this is the baseline characteristics you can see that uh, i guess the important part here i've already explained uh, almost half of the patients both in diabetes and non diabetes group had had hospitalization for heart failure earlier and i think that's important to remember The primary composite uh, outcome was clearly fair. Okay, okay. 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 Who did not have diabetes? That was the only difference. Otherwise, if you see the numbers in CV death hospitalization and the numbers in the primary composite outcome are same whether the person had diabetes or no diabetes. So, quite clearly, it was so striking that the drug now is an approval to to reduce the risk or treat heart failure even in those who do not have diabetes. So, I think this is very impressive. and of course we will uh, we won't talk too much about the mechanism for heart uh, benefit we will talk about it at, at the end just just to conclude and just to give you again an idea of proportion of patients in various trials uh, this is credence here dapa ckd so here and empa kidney so what is happening is that in 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 the in the uh, dapa ckd there was a different proportion of albuminuria patients as compared to credence and and empa kidney and we look at that when we come to uh, the study itself if you look at where did it go yeah so if, by and large if you look at it there were clearly sicker patients that were included in empa reg and in their canvas trial and less in the in the dapa ckd and this is especially uh, in in the sorry I, i'm going on declared to me i'm comparing declared to me canvas and empire dapa ckd is coming after this so when you look at these you realize very clearly that in in these three studies declared to me had the healthiest patients right and canvas and empire had definitely sicker patients both in terms of stage of gfr and in terms of albuminuria so because remember that the 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 declared to me excluded patients with egfr less than 60 but here comes the the final uh, study of dapa ckd which is actually on 
which went what down to an EGFR of 25. So if you're talking of EGFR 25 to 75, you're really looking now at patients who have renal involvement, whereas the one that I showed you, the the the, the, the declared team, did not have patients with EGFR lower than 60. So if you look at this, you very clearly can see, again, this is an international trial, 386 centers, and you're looking at dapagliflozin versus matching placebo, and the inclusion criteria were, of course, more than 18, 25 to 75, you know, the adrenal excretion. So now we are looking at renal outcomes in patients with chronic kidney disease, right? And if you look at that again, sustained more than 50% decline, end-stage disease or renal or CV death was clearly lower in the DAPA. I don't think we need to go too much into that, uh, but it's very obvious that this happened. The effect was very striking. The effect on the kidney is more striking than on the heart. Secondary outcome, sustained decline in EGFR, and stage renal, renal death, again, look at the hazard ratio, 0 0.56, 0 0.61. So 40% reduction in these renal endpoints. We leave that. In patients with CKD, with and without type 2 diabetes, DAPA compared to placebo significantly reduce the risk of kidney failure, reduce risk of CV death or heart failure hospitalization, and prolonged survival. What could it be doing? It could be doing many things in the kidney. Uh, it reduces intracalamarial pressure. So the basics are reduction in glucose, reduction in BP arterial stiffness, and albumin reduction in albumin media. By reducing intracalamarial pressure, reducing volume, reducing inflammation and fibrosis, reducing oxidant stress, intrarenal angiotensin upregulation, overall increased natriuresis, improved autophagy, efficiency of substrate utilization, improve renal oxygenation. I would like you to think of SGL2 inhibitors. Where else do you see all these actions? What happens when beta blockers act on the heart? So I think are SGL2 inhibitors beta blockers for the kidney? Probably yes. They are, they are, they are, they are doing everything similar to what beta blockers do for the heart. They are they're improving the oxygenation. They are basically reducing consumption of energy. They are improving autophagy. So they are doing many, many things that calms the kidney down, like the beta blocker calms the heart down. And there are many other ways, you know. Uh, it's almost like an anti-aging thing for the kidney. Uh, the nutrient deprivation for the kidney activates AMPK and SIR2-1, which you know is involved in aging, reduction of interstitial fluid, healing of endothelium, remarkable action on the kidney. So I really think that these are renal drugs. I think they are primarily renal drugs. The effect that has in last been studied is the effect on the kidney. But they are primarily renal drugs because of which you find maximum effect on the kidney. Because they are, they are actually helping the kidney heal. Right? And in, in the case of diabetes, they, the, the excess reabsorption of glucose, so that burden is not there in the proximal tubular cells. And therefore, the the, the Corticular tubular interstitial damage, it recovers actually. And erythropoietin production by fibroblast is restored. And you know that anemia also improves with these drugs sometimes. So basically, the, the changes in the microenvironment that happen in type 2 diabetes are actually corrected by SGL2 inhibition. So as I said, they're primarily acting on the kidney. So no surprises that the most striking effect on the kidney, the second most striking effect is on heart failure. The third sort of questionable effect to my mind is the effect on actual coronary events They're seen in Empire I've seen canvas, but it's all mixed up. And probably if one really looked at it hard enough, many of much of the CV death reduction could have been simply a death due to heart failure. I'm not saying they don't have uh, reduction, they don't cause reduction in CV uh, events, but I would say that is secondary. By far the most consistent action is on heart failure, and the CV death action might possibly be related to the heart failure rather than anything else. The renal effect is the dominant effect. I think they're actually renal drugs. And the endocrinologist and diabetologist have enjoyed this because they actually found lowering of glucose. And that's how the whole thing started. And therefore, the drug is indicated in all these things. Overall good. And as I said, the book, the, the best things in life in the love notebook, actually, 
uh, it happened unexpectedly. They were talking about love, actually. We were talking about love with SGLT2. And actually, these drugs were designed originally to lower blood glucose. But unexpectedly, they found cardiac benefits and then subsequently huge renal benefits. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for the excellent presentation. Dr. S.K. Sharma has also joined us. Uh, sorry, sir. Good evening to both of our distinguished speakers. Actually, I was joined uh, in a wrong link, which is for the attendees. And they have sent me it just now. <laughs> so sorry for that, sir. Sorry. And uh, Dr. Uh, Amrish Mittal, sir, you had done a great job. And earlier we were saying that these drugs were uh, cardiac drugs. But now you have changed the phrase and you say they are primarily renal drugs. They have some benefit in the heart failure. And of course, mild effect on the mace. And of course, it is a diabetic drug also because it do reduces uh, HbA1c of our patient. Beautiful Thank inputs. You. Thank you. So now we can go to the next topic. Yeah. yeah. So we have. Yeah. So Dr. V. Mohan is uh, known to everybody, sir. You don't require any introduction. Uh, he's the giant in the field of diabetology. He's not only. Indian, but he's a global feature uh, and uh, person. And over to you, sir, for your uh, input. Thank you. Dr. Mohan and Dr. Shama, sir, uh, we'll have a short corporate presentation, sir. Just two minutes, sir. Okay. okay. I mean, it's not necessary, but okay. <laughs> so everything is now, uh, you can say, linked to the publicity. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we are 15 years young in healthcare. We are lead leaders in diabetes by overalls, by values and prescription. One out of every fifth prescription in diabetes contains a US UAD brand. We are leaders in technology of prescriptions. We are present in more than 75 countries. We are global leaders in genetic metformin. In fact, one third of the world's requirement of metformin is supplied by USA. We are partnership with Janssen for solution. That's Canadian philosophy. I perform gratitude to each and every one of you, your family, for being an integral part of our journey. Our aim to partner is to ensure better patient care so that India can be recognized as a health care capital rather than the disease capital of the world. Our roots are deeply ingrained in our Indian history. This is the picture of Dr. Vithal Balakrishnanthi, who is the founder of ESO. Here you can see uh, Dr. Vithal Balakrishnanthi in the United Nations meeting, along with the foreign delegates. Uh, in fact, the two states in Mumbai's business districts are named after founders. Here you can see uh, Vithal Gandhi in, dis in discussion with Jawaharlal Nehru, the Japanese delegation in India. And below we can see Arvind Gandhi with Dr. Kasmir Fung, who is recognized as the mentor of the US Pass for the manufacturing plants, who are under construction. This is the AP manufacturing facility, which does manufacturing manufacturing facilities, which manufacture active ingredients, branded genetics, and biosecurity enterprise. Uh, our quality of metformin is of highest quality. In fact, uh, most of our samples uh, do not even detect metformin, they have a detection limit and some are below quantitation limit. So you can be assured about the quality of metformin that is manufactured by uh, USC. Following other few uh, well-known brands of uh, USC, Glycomid, Glycomid GP, Glycomid Trio, Udapa, Triglanis, Jara, Jara M, Suicent, Pios, Dianis F, Amlopin, Rosary Range, Tazlo Range, Medzine Range, Ticospin Range, and Ticospin. They believe knowing is not enough, you must apply. Wishing is not enough, you must do. If you want to see the change, be the change. We have partnership with physicians in five days. We have conducted surveillance activities through NDTV 24-7 and Facebook Live. We have more than 8 million, million viewership in six months. We also have seen the education of medical faculty through our NDC program, Metformin Summit and Diabetic for Education program. We are tied up with RSJ for 700 plus digital CMEs for diabetes education for primary physicians, uh, physicians over the next three years. We have strengthened research through the IDVP, which was supported by USB. We encourage research of young postgraduates through AV Gandhi Awards for Excellence to provide infrastructure for the National Diabetes Education Program. And we are also helping in the detection of the undiagnosed pool of patients of diabetes and hypertension. We want to do something for today so that our future physicians can be thanked us for. Although we can't change the world, but we can definitely do our bit. We have also been providing uh, protection gears to healthcare professionals against COVID 19. We have been supplying more than 29.9 lakhs units till now. Life without purpose, purpose is meaningless. We have a purpose which is beyond business to be a partner of you and your patient's journey. Support for your safety against COVID 19 continues. Uh, and this is the support that we have provided till September 2020. 
and more support continues. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Bhimal, I'll just share your CV also. Just well, it's uh, not necessary, I think, Kelly, just go on. It's just of time. I'll go on. It's of time, I think everybody knows. So we'll go on with this. Okay. So I'd like to uh, thank uh, USV for Chris asking me to be in such an august company of Dr. Amrish Mittal and Dr. S.K. Sharma for today's uh, talk. You had a beautiful talk from Dr. Mittal, very, very nicely summarized all the scientific evidence for this wonderful group of drugs, SJT tools, and in general, and Tapagliflozin in particular. He showed you the cardiac benefits, renal benefits, and of course, the weight loss and the diabetes benefits as well. What I'm trying to uh, tell you in the next, uh, say, 10 or 15 minutes will be to talk to something about the importance of uh, pharmacoeconomics as well when you talk about these drugs. The problem is that when these newer drugs come, they're quite expensive and therefore beyond the reach of the common man. Now that DAPA is uh, kind of going off patent and becoming available, I'll show you how much difference it makes to the patient. So mine will be a, uh, not too much of a scientific talk, uh, although I do work with all these uh, companies. So let me get on uh, to this talk. So when you talk of the diabetes economy in India, there are many points that uh, you should know. Because in, on an average, the patients spend about 10,000 rupees a year on diabetes in urban areas, about 6,000 rupees in rural areas. And of course, you have complications, then they spend much more. Poor people have to spend, of course, everybody pays uh, out of pocket. 80% of uh, medical care in India is private and therefore out of pocket. For the rich man, it probably doesn't uh, uh, affect uh, his or her uh, life. But in the case of a poor person, uh, almost 20-25% of their income probably goes to treatment of chronic diseases like uh, diabetes. And several studies have uh, reported on the socioeconomic gradient. And one of the things that we have reported recently in the ICMR in that study is that diabetes is no longer a disease of the rich. In the more developed states, particularly in, in southern India and in the urban areas, today more poor people have diabetes than the rich. So it no longer can be considered as a disease of the rich. And this was actually reviewed in one of my uh, articles. We also done some cost economic uh, uh, you know, studies. And this is a particular study which is very uh, detailed. And we looked at uh, comparing private hospitals with uh, private clinics with government clinics, and also looked at urban and rural. I'm not going to the details of this, but this is a report which we published in Global Health Economics and Genomics. Uh, so the conclusion was that excess health expenditure and lost productivity among individuals with diabetes are substantial. So we also compared with non-diabetic people to see whether there is how much more they are spending. Obviously, if you have diabetes, you, you spend much more. And therefore, we called for innovative solutions to treat diabetes and to reduce the cost burden. That is what it was about. Now, diabetes is a costly disease. And um, in some ways, it, I won't say I would say treating diabetes is uh, costly to some extent, but not treating diabetes is 100 times more costly because the cost of uh, eye complication, kidney complication, particularly, can be humongous. Now, this is the average expenditure per patient per year. Even if you take it as 4,500 rupees per a year, in five years, that is 50,000. In 20 years, it's 8 lakhs that one patient spends. Now, you multiply that by 8 crores which is the number of uh, patients uh, with diabetes in India. And you cannot even imagine the number of zeros that you have to put. So it is indeed a huge cost on the economy. There's no getting away from it. Um, it there's another paper where we looked at the breakdown of the cost. And we, we have classified that into direct cost, indirect cost, and intangible cost. Sometimes some of the things you can't put uh, a price on it. Reduce life expectancy. What, what value would you put on somebody who, who dies or not? or pain, discomfort, stress, anxiety. These are all intangible costs. But the actual cost can be split into medical costs where cost of the drugs and the cost of the laboratory testing will come right on top. Of course, I'm not even talking about non-medical costs like cost of transportation, etc. Now, are these complications very rare? No, actually, they are more common. Uh, just, yes, just this morning, yesterday, we published a paper comparing complications in type 1 diabetes in India, in the Indians in India, and the Indians in the UK and the white population. Turned out 
It's a very large study, about 4,000 type ones or so. And where we, what we found was that kidney complications and eye complications are certainly more in the type 1 diabetes in India, probably partly due to uh, lack of control, worse control, although we try to correct for that. Uh, but the uh, bottom line is that there is an early decline in beta cell function, high inflammatory markers, and many other dyslipidemia, which makes us more prone to cardiovascular risk. Now, as the number of complications increase, we have one complication, two complications, three complications. As that goes on, you will find that uh, the increasing duration of diabetes, more complications second, and I need not tell this audience that the more complications we have, the costlier the treatment gets. For example, if you have heart and kidney, imagine how much more you'll be spending than if you are a diabetic patient with no kidney complication, no heart complication. Now, this is again to show you that if you have uh, retinopathy or nephropathy or any of the complications, this is from two studies, one from uh, Kamala Sangam et al. and the other a study where you look at as you have complications, the, the cost keeps shooting up. For example, if you have a foot, bad foot problem and you're admitted in the hospital for a month, you can imagine how much of money that you will have to spend. Um, the other thing that we know is that if you look at the duration of diabetes, as the duration of diabetes increases, the costs of all medications go up because you'll also need statins and antihypertensive drugs and so on. But specifically shown in red, the cost of the diabetic medications, that also goes up. Uh, this is a study which uh, Dr. Vijay Vishman, my brother, uh, did, where uh, he looked at uh, what happens, why is the cost so important. Uh, people, you know, use up their personal savings and then they have to sell property if they get into a kidney problem or a foot problem uh, where they have to spend a lot of money. They have to actually sell some of their property and so on or the jewels uh, and so on. Imagine in rural India, a poor farmer, if he gets a problem, what he's going to do. So I'm just telling you how cost is important in India. And this is again, uh, you know, another study which showed that if you have foot complications, you spend four times more than patients without any complications. If you have renal or any other complication, also you spend three times more than if you uh, than patients without any complications. So that brings us to the topic of pharmacoeconomics, where you have to look at the cost versus the benefit as well as the quality of life. I'm not going to go into details, uh, you know, about this, but there are many factors which are used, like the cost minimization analysis, CMA, cost effectiveness analysis, cost utility analysis, and cost benefit analysis. All these are used by economists to see whether a particular treatment you give is effective or not. In the cost minimization analysis, if you look at generic depogliflozin versus innovative depogliflozin, the cost per day is 15 rupees for a generic drug whereas it is 56 rupees for the innovator molecule. And that if you work out the cost per year, turns out it's 5,000 rupees if you use generic and 20,000 if you use uh, the, uh, the innovator drug. So obviously that is why generics are so uh, popular and even our government and our prime minister and everybody talks about using generics wherever possible. Now the cost effectiveness an analysis, if you see, is the, how much of, do you spend, for example, to reduce fasting blood sugar. Uh, what is the cost per unit decrease in fasting blood sugar? So if you look at that, the decrease in uh, fasting, for, for every milligram reduction in fasting uh, uh, blood sugar, you spend uh, with a generic drug, uh, you, you spend about this much. But even with a drug like Remo, which has come very, very cheap to our country, and before DAPA became um, a generic drug, it was Remo which was used for people who could not afford. It, it turns out that the ACER uh, or the cost effectiveness is actually better with the generic dapagliflozin compared to the Remo. Again, if you look at the uh, cost utility analysis, since you just heard the talk by uh, Dr. Mittal, it improves, uh, you know, glycemic benefit, weight loss, reduction of heart failure, as well as uh, three-point maze and Remo protection. So given all of these, improved quality of life is definitely uh, something which you will agree with me uh, exists with this drug. So uh, as far as the cost of utility is concerned, if you look at the evidence base, we must be honest that while Remo is inexpensive, we really don't have hard data. Where is the CTOT trial? Where are the major trials? They're not, it's not even yeah. used in any other country. So we don't have evidence. Yeah. Whereas in DAPA, we have had all the trials which were just listed, we just heard, uh, with the effects on all of these, and therefore exposed uh, compared to uh, Remo. 
Now, this is a nice slide which I like. Now, if you put, you know, the, if you can uh, put this table like this and look at the uh, best cost effectiveness and the least cost effectiveness, and then the least assured utility and the best assured utility, a generic Daphne clause will now sit in this, where the best cost effectiveness and the best uh, assured utility, because uh, it is cheap and also has been proven to be very good. Now, while these other drugs are very good, Empa, Cana, and DAPA, as far as the effectiveness is concerned, uh, it is very, very uh, good and the utility, uh, but cost is definitely a factor. So I'm just going to end here by making this pitch that if you can get this really good quality drugs and the, the molecules that have been shown uh, to be really, really good at a cheaper price, then it's a clear case of a winner. I don't think anybody can argue against that. And uh, so the total annual expenditure is very high. The economy of diabetes controlled by direct and indirect costs. Strict glycemic control, weight loss, and cardiovascular benefits uh, make this class most suitable to manage type 2 diabetes. And DAPA has shown an upper rate in the cost effective analysis uh, compared to Remo. And uh, particularly now that the generic drugs have come, it's a big boon uh, for our country. So I'll stop here. And then if there are any questions, uh, we can take them, I'm sure. Dr. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. You have rightly highlighted that diabetes is a very costly affair. And as you rightly highlighted that once the patient is developing complication, the cost of treating diabetes and its complication becomes very, very huge. Sir. And many times our patients complain that, doctor, you have reduced so many drugs and they cost huge. We can't help it because the patient has to be treated for diabetes as well as hypertension, as well as dyslipidemia. And once he is having more complications, like you have given an example of diabetic foot problem, then it becomes really, really problematic. And the cost behind the curtain, as you rightly highlighted, the quality of life. Now, what is the quality of life of these patients? So thank you very much, sir, for your beautiful uh, illustration of cost in the management of our diabetic patient. Thank you very much. Uh, don't think so there are questions there. Uh, can you see, um, dear friend? Yes, sir. So there are some questions which are coming from the audience because they have a separate link. Uh, I'll just read out a few questions, sir. Uh, one question is, sir, what is the role of double for in non-diabetic patients? I'm ready for like, okay. I think we already discussed that with both the DEPA heart failure and the DAPA CKD studies had a significant proportion of patients who were not diabetic. And as I was trying to sort of conceptualize, you have to think of these drugs where diabetes is an add-on benefit actually. And I think they really are uh, going to be used more and more in patients for prevention of progression of CKD or for prevention of heart failure in those who are at risk. So quite, then it's been approved for, for, uh, for heart failure. So quite clearly, diabetes is important, but the drugs work with or without diabetes for prevention of heart failure and prevention of progression of CKD. Thank you, sir. And Canadian uh, uh, guidelines are highlighting this point, sir, that uh, for uh, reduction of hospitalization for heart failure, even in patients without diabetes, they yes. recommend yes. 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 Uh, sir, we have a parallel link where the participants were shown some poll questions. So the results of the poll questions are now available. I can ask my technical team to share the questions and the results of the poll questions. Fatima, can you share the yeah. results? Yeah, sure. Is visible? Not yet. I can't see yes, this. Not yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes, yes. Can you make it F11? I can't read the thing. Yeah, yeah. That's very interesting. So the question was in people with diabetes and at risk of ACVD, CKDOHF, after metformin, do you prescribe SJ20 meters irrespective of your baseline target HBA1C? And here we get 45% uh, audience has given in most patients. And then we have 53% saying, uh, 33% saying uh, always. And then we have in a few patients and rarely. So this is basically from the ADA guidelines. And I think there's a good acceptance of the ADA guidelines. Uh, 
डॉक्टर मोहन विद द कॉस्ट ऑफ डाटा कलेक्शन आई थिंक दिस परसेंटेज वुड बी इंक्रीज कल जी नो नो आई जस्ट नाउ कम इन सो आई एम श्योर दैट इट इज डेफिनेटली गोइंग टू गो अप सी इफ यू जस्ट लुक एट यू नो द टेनली सिस्टम स्टोरी एंड द रिमोटिंग प्रोसेसिंग स्टोरी एवरीबॉडी नोस दैट there are no cvot trials it's not used in any other country it is only in india 